So I'm actually going to record. He's going to be this, our second speaker. Um, so I built this site so that I can um, just going to kind of be able to use bookmarks to kind of insert some content. And so I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know if I follow uh, Portuguese. So this is going to have to be in English. So uh, everything is up here. So hopefully that makes it easier to follow along. Um, although you all seem to have much, much better English than I have Portuguese. So, um, so I am a director of engineering for a small nonprofit uh, based in the United States. We have with people in the UK and uh, spread out across the United States. We're a hundred percent distributed organization. So um, we're all remote every day. We're kind of all in the same boat that way. Um, the SaaS product we were just discussing, we have a, uh, we build a product that allows you to annotate on the web. So what that means is you can, instead of having comments at the bottom of a web page or something, you could just, you can select a little piece of text and then you leave a note about just that text selection. So um, a little bit like, you know, if you were reading a book and you had a highlighter, you could write, write notes in the margin or something. So we have a tool that allows you to do that all over the web. Um, so uh, we could talk more about that at some point if we want. But um, something I do on the side is I'm an advisor at a code school in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from. Um, I, was, I was an instructor there a couple of summers ago, and now I'm on, like, on their uh, kind of board uh, advising them. So one of the things I do sometimes I go, I'll go in and give talks to their classes about specific topics. Um, the instructors there are a lot better at Python than they are at JavaScript. So I often do a talk on uh, kind of ESX, kind of latest JavaScript features there. And so I have a, a website here that you can go to that kind of goes over the highlights of ES6 um, a little bit superficially. So what, I, what I'm going to do tonight, just to you know, take 10 or 15 minutes, is go a little deeper into just one of those topics, so template those. So um, as you probably are all, anybody who writes JavaScript who's here, uh, does everyone here familiar with JavaScript or writes JavaScript? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, read it at least, right? <laughs> Can you read JavaScript at least, or do you write JavaScript? Okay, okay, perfect, great. So we all know that um, you know there's always been you know a few ways to create strings in, in JavaScript. Um, you know, uh, you probably don't want to be using new string if you can help it. Um, if there's any use, good use case for new, the new string constructor, I'd love to hear it, but I've never never heard one. Um, but uh, what ES6 does is it allows you to. Um, it has this other this kind of new way of creating strings. So it's using backticks. Um, I'm not going to click on that link. Uh, I'll let, let Pedro do that with his computer if he wants to. <laughs> you don't have to, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of gross. That, you know what a tick is. I don't know what that tra translates into. Yeah, you don't have to look at it. I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, so there's this, there's this new way of creating strings. Um, one of the nice things about that is that it allows you to insert any kind of quotes inside there. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you made the string out of single quotes and you want to have a single quote in there somewhere, it's, you're not going to break anything. Um, but that's not all that interesting. One, another thing it does is it lets you have multi-string lines, or um, multi-line strings, sorry, uh, which is something that was a long time coming. And back in the day, you had to do all kinds of weird, you know, kind of contortions to get that to work. Um, and something else that it does, and you may also you may already know this, is that it can work like a template. So you here in this case, you know, we've uh, created a variable uh, that contains a string, and then we're using the back ticks, and then this dollar sign brace, open brace, close brace thing around the variable name, and it outputs, you know, it, it inserts that string into into the template string. So that's a new capability that's kind of um, exciting. You can um, use anything that evaluates to, that can evaluate to a string can go in there too. So here we have two variables, you know, H and I with the values one and two, and we output them, but then we can also just add them right in place inside the, inside that kind of replacement token, and it will output the, the result of that expression. So that's, that's kind of cool, getting more, a little more interesting. So um, you can also, anything, you know, <laughs> Uh, return values from functions are often expressions as well. So as long as they re resolve to a value, you can you can just put call the function directly in there too, um, and it'll insert that. Okay, getting a little more interesting still. So um, now this is something. This is almost an aside, but uh, this kind of blew my mind. You can actually nest um, the back ticks. So in this case, you know we have this string that's sort of uh, surrounded by back ticks, and inside one of these 
expressions or one of these um, kind of replacement tokens, I guess, we have a whole other expression that it contains backticks. So it's a little weird when you first see it, but um, totally legal. So it's kind of fun. Um, now where it really starts to get interesting is something called tags templates. So um, you can create a function um, and it, the syntax for this is actually pretty strange. It doesn't, there's no analog anywhere else in JavaScript that I know of for this syntax, but um, we'll go into that in a second. You can create a function basically that processes the template um, you know, at, at runtime. Um, so the first time that I came across this, you know, I knew about the basic templating and things, but I was working at a job. The job before this, I was actually an individual contributor on a pretty complex okay. app, and um, we were, you know, we're based in the U.S., so we didn't have a localized like most U.S. websites aren't localized. But we were considering doing that, and so um, I looked into this kind of, you know, if there was some way to uh, to use this this capability. Um, it turned out it's. Um, have you ever heard that saying where it's, you know, if you're, if you're coding kind of at the edge of your own comprehension, six, mo six months from now, you're going to look back and be like, what does that do? I don't I have no idea what that does. So this is a case of that for me. So um, I'm using, uh, you know, kind of MapReduce and some of these kind of things to combine a bunch of arguments. And there's like this thing that, you know, depending on the number of arguments, inserts like an ampersand and stuff. But anyway, the idea was that we'd be able to create these, um, Kind of create functions that we could then call later with, uh, you know, with some kind of uh, form, you know, localization key or something that would allow us to easily, easily in quotes <coughs> or back ticks, I guess, um, translate these strings. So anyway, that you're, you know, you're welcome to look at this later, but I would have to sit and kind of look at this again to really understand what I'm doing. Let's see, what I'm kind of trying to figure it out. <laughs> so I can leave it up there for a second. But, um, anyway, so you know, reduce basically is used when you you have a bunch of you want to kind of reduce everything down to a single value. And so in this case, the single value is the output string. Um, anyway, this isn't the point of the thing. It's mostly to say like uh, you can you can kind of go crazy with this stuff, um, but I don't recommend. It. Anyway, all right. So that's that's how I came to understand or to kind of learn about tag templates. So. Um, this is what I would consider sort of the most basic kind of uh, tag template example. So here's what I was, what I was saying that the, the syntax is a little weird. So this is actually the function up here, formatter. And then it just starts with the backticked string. This is actually syntactic sugar, but I can't remember for what exactly. There's, there's some other way to call this that would do the same thing. But um, so formatter is the function. Um, the, the backtick string uh, is our, you know, our template string. And then in this case, we're returning a, an object that has a format function. And so we are able to call that format function, pass in a couple of arguments, and have, you know, have this be the output. So um, does, this, does this example kind of make sense to people? Does it uh, kind of I can also. You can kind of prove that it works if you want. So, <laughs> so I'll put the uh, formatter thing in here. I haven't changed anything since the last time I verified this work. And it works. So, um, so that, I'm actually going to kind of break that down a little bit um, because it looks kind of complicated, but it's it's not it's not super complicated. This is JavaScript. So. Um, the formatter function, this kind of tag, the, I'm not sure what that function is called actually. So this is, this is a tag template because it has this, so I guess this is the tag. I don't know, the formatter function is the tag. So that, that function takes um, an array of the literals from this, the backtick string, okay? So in this case, um, out of the string, it's, it's from the backtick up until the dollar sign, right? So hello comma space, that's the first uh, literal to get past it. And then dot, this is a space, is the second one. And then just a dot, and this is the third one. So those are the literals that get passed in. So it gets this array, this is an array of literals and strings, basically. And then the inner function, the format function, we, uh, we're, pa you know, we're passing in these arguments. We're gonna do a spread operator, are people familiar with that from the S6? So we're gonna take those 
those arguments and we're going to make ourselves an array out of those that we can then iterate over. Um, so we get a, this array of world and test are the two uh, values that we're passing in. So basically all this, all this really does is it just kind of, uh, you know, it iterates over the, the literals and depending on where, where we are in the, in the sequence, it just inserts the strings and outputs a string at the end using good old join on an empty string, which is kind of old school, but it works. So um, now this has a, a little bug in it. And I don't know if anybody wants to guess it. What the bug is. How would you, um, like what would you do to, like what kind of tests would you put on this to, to verify that it works as expected? If you were test driven, which I obviously am not in my presentation. Test the edge cases for uh -huh. no substitutions, for instance. Uh huh. Okay. Or more substitutions than to. Than to. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start with that, with that simple test. Yeah. Then okay. I'll get there. Yeah. So um, you actually hit on it in your second one in that. Um, uh, this little bug is that if you have an extra. Oh man, it didn't get formatted correctly. Oh, I think, uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, that's better. So if, if there's an extra, um, you know, if there's more, if there are more, uh, actually I think if it's only if there's one more, it's only gonna show up, that one is gonna show up, but it's gonna append that to the string um, when it's not really intended to. And I'm just gonna live with that for the rest of the presentation. I'm not gonna fix that. <laughs> I just wanna keep the example simple, but that's, that is, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, so moving on. So it's also this, the function is not very smart. So um, in, in this case, you know, I'm using zero for both of the, the kind of placeholders. Um, it would be better if we could actually, you know, say like kind of use them like we do indexes in an array, right? So um, we're going to change the function so that this, this works. Um, Let's do that. This is so much easier than actual live coding. This, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you notice, the difference here is that we've added a, a keys uh, argument to our original format or function, um, so that now we have not only the array of the literals themselves, but an array of the keys. So the keys here. Um, this is basically anytime you do a tag template, the thing that you get, the thing that gets passed into the function is first an array of the literals and then a bunch of arguments, whatever the keys are, we're just in a, a series of arguments. So we're just going to roll all of those up into a, an array. Um, and then the other thing that we changed here, so if you look here, there's substitution sub i. Here now it's substitution sub keys sub i. So instead of just whatever the number is in the sequence, we're um, actually looking up which key we should be using um, for, you know, to, to pull out the substitution string. So otherwise it's the same, but now we can, maybe pizza is amazing. Yes, pizza, I emphasize that. I hope everybody agrees with that statement. <laughs> um, all right, so the thing, the next thing, I hope this is easy. So, now we're gonna make it so that we can, is this a good, is that a good translation of amazing? Yep. Is that okay? It's good enough? It's amazing. It's a <laughs> amazing. Surprendente, uh, translation. All right, um, so we're gonna make this so that we can, we can uh, you know, localize our, our strings. So we have this strings array. Um, pizza seems to be the same word. Um, and this is all the same, except uh, the only thing we're doing here is instead of just kind of directly looking up the substitution, we're going to um, use that as a key against our strings object. Um, and so now we can do this kind of thing where we, first we tell it uh, the language that we want to use so that we know which key to, here to use, right? And then it takes these as keys instead of literal strings that we're just going to insert and it looks up the the translations for those. So, um, so that's all getting a little more interesting, right? That's kind of kind of fun. Um, now you may want to. It's also possible, I guess, to do this without um, those positional uh, tokens, but use actual named um, substitutions. So 
In this case, uh, now the keys are, um, this actually simplifies things a bit because we're using the keys. They're actually the keys from the, ob the uh, translation the strings object. Um, I'm just looking those up directly. And in this case, we're just passing in which set of strings we want to use, and then we're kind of done. So, um, so yeah, so that's that. Now, this is where I think it actually kind of gets a little more fun, even. And um, you can, you know, it's just, you can, I mean, it's just JavaScript, so you can be passing in whatever you want. Uh, but, it, you know, here we're going to, um, we're going to pass in a function that can transform the information so that um, it's, I guess it's another form of localization, maybe, but, uh, you know, you can, you can basically act on, on the data before, before it's uh, combined into a string. So, um, you know, using the same, the same string literal, um, the same data, and then just passing in which function we want to have act on it. Um, and this is just very basic. I'm sure there are lots of edge cases with these two functions, but just as an example, um, to, uh, to kind of show some different formatting for the different, uh, you know, based on, you know, just kind of trivially being able to reformat the data. Um, all right. Now, I think where the real power comes in um, is that, you know, this, uh, this, this tag actually just in our, you know, the way we've written this, it re just returns a function. So we can actually just take that, and this was the whole point of my, that gist that I had earlier, was I wanted to be able to kind of create these things in advance and then use them around my program later. And that's the, one of the great things about this is that you can just, you can call this, store it in a variable, pass it around the program and use it whenever you actually need it. Um, most of the examples I see of template literals is you kind of, you, they're all in place and they're just kind of being executed right there. And, um, there's not a lot of kind of uh, thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, kind of reuse or, or kind of architecture uh, in that way. So, um, so here we, here's just an example of kind of calling that later, um, passing in the same arguments, but having a, uh, you know, it's having a function available. Here. And it's lightning talk, so that's it. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, thank you, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Peter. I'm gonna turn the volume up now, Peter. So people can hear you, and I'm going to turn my computer around so that people can see you, and you can see them. So I'm going to turn him around. So Peter, you're going to screen share, I assume, right? Um, <laughs> when I don't have the slides, oh, you don't have slides. Okay. Or when I get it, then I'll share something. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, so this is uh, Mbanugo from Lagos. And uh, he built the framework that I used for, for demo fun. So I'm mm -hmm. not about that. Go for it. Hello, good evening. My, My name is, is Sam Mbanugo, and I'm from Nigeria. I'm based in Lagos. I am a software developer and also an entrepreneur. Uh, currently working on Harmony Sync, which is a real time state synchronization service that provides SDK currently in JavaScript. So you would have seen it a bit from the demo and you just gave. So the idea about the Harmony Sync is a real time state synchronization service which allows you to synchronize your application states in real time and can be used for things like um, real time chats or real time um, data visualization. So the problem I wanted to solve with the SDK for me was I've had instances where I've had instances where I had to, I needed to add um, real time to maybe a dashboard to show real time statistics and most of the time it's been um, similar code and doing the same thing over and over again. So I wanted to build something that would help me manage states for an application and synchronize source service and I've used the um, Signal R 
from Microsoft in the past, and I've also been using Socket IO for a while. I use Socket IO for a chart SDK I, I did during the product hunt hackathon. So I decided to use um, Signal and um, Socket IO for the current app. So I wanted a way to to add have an SDK that I can integrate to any of my apps, be it mobile or web app. I wanted to avoid designing from scratch each time I want to design around socket IO. And I wanted to make it an easy process. So I built Harmony Sync. You can check it out at harmony.tech. For this project, the tech stack I used involved using um, socket IO for the real time states. I'm using CouchDB to store data on the cloud, hosted on CloudEnt. And I decided on CouchDB. I decided on CouchDB because it has a way of helping manage um, data conflicts. And so data conflict would come up often during uh, um, real time applications where maybe a user is making changes while they are offline. So I wanted a way to a system that already has something built in. So I chose CouchDB. And the way I've implemented conflict resolution is that it would reject any conflict from the application that has been modified by another user. So it avoids, helps you avoid overwriting another user's data. Maybe if you if that current user has been a widely updated your state. And it also has an API that when it is synchronized, it will give you inspire that you have a new update and you should uh, update your application. So for source control, I'm I'm using Git and hosted on GitLab. Um, I've, I have my I have the website just on plain uh, JavaScript hosted on Netlify. The dashboard is built on React, just basic dashboard. And it's also using a uh, AWS Amplify, which is a, a library from AWS to easily integrate um, AWS Cognito, which is for authentication, to a React app. So I didn't want to put all those up by myself. So I added AWS Amplify and it calls out to an API hosted on AWS Lambda and API Gateway. And for documentation, I, I had to pick um, using a couple of other options from like GitHub, Slate, and Fink. And I had to choose between, I had to choose GitHub because it was easy to use and customize. So I chose GitHub. So the documentation is good using GitHub, and you can find it online. To package my SDK for use in Node and PS5, I used the um, rollup to do the packaging on it. So you can find it available on, on NPM JS. The challenges, you might ask the challenges I faced while building this project. I didn't have um, so much of a challenge. Uh, at first, it was trying to uh, customize AWS because that was the first time I'm using, I was using AWS for something. So I had to do a lot of learning on how to customize their services during the, uh, to fit my products. So, and I had a couple of 
free AWS credit. So I wanted to use them for for the app held by hosting AWS. And so I launched the project on March 23rd. Um, publicly, it's currently on beta. You can try it out and let me know what you think. I'd like to show you a demo of how the SDK works and what it can do. Share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. So this is a sample app you can normally see. It's a real time data grid. Yeah, maybe you have uh, an application that shows data on like in a tabular format and you want uh, multiple users to collaborate and change data on it. So I don't have the sample online yet, but I have a code on this of which I can share with them. It allows you to change data in real time. So I can change this name here and you see it reflect on the other browser. Can you see the effect? So this a basic React data grid, can be that way. And integrating with, <coughs> excuse me, integrating with gators, integrating with harmonic sync it's it's uh, easy. You go onto the website, sign up for an account. And when you sign up, you can create an application. So I'm already signing. You can create an application that gives you an application ID. And if you want to see your account ID, you can click this button and it will display your account ID. If you use React, you Start from NPM, NPM, and you get the package. And you can make available a class camp name harmony, which you can initialize with your account ID and, and the app application ID. This is for my demo. This is running on a local instance. And 
have to call connect on that instance to connect to Harmony server. Then when you're connected, you can create your application state. So um, sync categorizes application state into true format, which is a value and primitive object primitive in this primitive. The value primitive is typically used to store uh, value types like maybe Julian numbers, strings, and uh, object primitive used to store plain JavaScript objects. While it needs to give you a, a list of objects which can be manipulated using indexes. So for this sample, I've used the list primitive type, and I've already created the, the states. So this is the sample code to create the states with some default value. So we call create list to create a list state type, and when it's created, you can. Later on in another app, get the state by calling get passing in the name of the primitive. Um, when the when this different the state is gotten, I can assign the state value to React state object. And that state primitive is object contains method that you can subscribe to to the get updates on the state changes. For a list primitive, there are two, two ob objects, two methods you can use, which is item added and item updated. Item added is used when there is a new item added to the, to the list and it provides you with the newly item added. The updated gives you the updated item. So here, when um, when the item is when there's a new item, I retrieve, I add it to initial state to render the application. I do similar thing for the updates. Then there's this on field change method, which is used by the React data grid, React spreadsheet grid library, which is what I use to render the data grid on the UI. So it calls this method each time there's a change in a row. So each time there's a change, I will call update on that state primitive to update the state. To send it to the server. Once it's updated, the server will notify all the connected clients and they will see the response through the item updated or item added. So the rest of the code is just to handle the creation of data. This, there's a little form here which to add new row to, to, to the list. And that's all what this code does here. Most of the other code there is just to render the application to React, React spreadsheet. Can you hear me clearly? Following. Hello. Hello, can you hear me?
Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, that's pretty cool. Is anybody, yeah. Are you done? Yeah, so uh, that's uh, most of it about Harmony. You can find the website on harmony.tech. Uh, got the documentation, which maybe if I was pretty fast in what I was saying, I need to grab something and check out the documentation. And it's still a work in progress for me, and I would pretty much appreciate any feedback on it. Or and if you are looking on using it for something you're working on at work, you can feel free to reach out to me and we can work together and see how. Get you on board with you. I hope. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Cool. Thanks very much for the demo. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. All right. cool. So, I'll turn it over to Pedro to talk about the my. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm going to try to put this Peter so you can see the see his presentation. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Pedro. Uh, I work for Protocol Labs, which is built at DFS, uh, which is a centralized uh, file exchange protocol. And today I'm here to talk about something, uh, a, lot of a lot of letters, uh, but it's kind of simple. Uh, it's called CRDTs. And um, they serve to provide coordination free real time collaboration. Um, so, first, a show of hands. Um, who has uh, used Google Docs? Everyone. Um, who has tried to use Google Docs offline? Not on purpose. Not on purpose. <laughs> but it, this is what happens to when we try uh, uh, to use Google Docs online, offline. You cannot edit the document. Uh, so, you can only edit the document while you are online. And I'm going to uh, explain why that is. So, that makes me a bit sad. Um, also, I'm kind of worried that uh, Google is spying on you because you have to know at least some metadata of the document. And it's kind of uh, fashionable to be concerned about privacy, but I think it's a real, uh, a real concern. So it has to know at least about the metadata, but I think it knows about the data. Uh, so, ah, uh, Google Docs is built uh, using a framework, a mathematical framework of operational transforms. And that, that operational transforms require uh, some synchronization between tools. And the word operational transform means that all the edits on the document are going to be translated into operations, and each operation is going to be transformed when it's going to be sent to each one of the clients. So if I'm connected to someone else, I make a transformation to some transformations at the same time. These are going to be sorted differently for each one of us, a large space which is going to be different, but they are going to be translated. For instance, if I'm inserting at position three, and you're inserting at position three at the same time, we cannot both be inserted. 
one of us will lose, how we lose four, we will lose three of us. Of course, one thing is that we get the same state, as you mentioned, right? We all see the same document, we all converge. So, operational transform is preparing you that strong event that you see in the code that at the end, when everyone stops to touch on the keyboards, they still see the same topic, see the same result. But unfortunately, operational transforms kind of uh, makes you have to use a central service that knows about the content of the operation. So at the end, Google servers have to know the content of your topic. Okay, so is there an alternative? So before we, 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 we dive into that, I'm just going to state some some brief goals. Um, so I want to have a completely decentralized system, so no privileged nodes uh, here. So only users. If I'm editing a document, if I'm editing a document, I connect directly to you. So all the users can see the document. We all connect to each other somehow. Uh, so it's uh, gonna all collaborate in concurrently editing the same data. It's not you don't have to take turns editing the data. It's much like a lot of systems that you edit at the same time in near real time, meaning that by way important network conditions are all connected and we can all see in soft real time of each other's updates, much like the internet. Offline first, which Googlebox doesn't allow, meaning that I can go offline, edit the document, and later my changes will sync up with everyone else. If you, the same happens when you're offline. If you all look all each separate way and each one of us is editing the document, hopefully eventually it doesn't work, we all can join at the end of the day or End of the next month or year, and we can still continue to work and we don't see each other's changes. Um, what was the big one? So, I'll, so the state converges on all the replicas, meaning we all get to see the same state at the end, and we should support different types of data, not only strings, but also more complex types that support modifications like arrays and maps and sets and, and the position of. So uh, there's a new thing called, well, kind of new thing, it's a seven, year, seven years old, called Multi-Tree Replicated Data Count. And it was defined in 2011 by three, uh, well, four people, Mark Shapiro, Nuno Perghisa, Carlos Vaquero, and Mark Zalewski. Uh, Nuno Perghisa is Portuguese, Carlos Vaquero is, is or was working so it's kind of recent thing, but it has uh, spawned a lot of other articles, other papers, other pieces about certainty, just involving certainty, solving certainties for a different bunch of use cases. Um, so what is a CRDP? Uh, Multi-tree replicated data type is a data structure that can be replicated across multiple computers over a network, um, where they can be updated independently without coordination, so without Anyone having to sync or you know, uh, with, with waiting for anything. Um, where it's all mathematically impossible to resolve inconsistencies which might be discovered. Okay? So, inconsistencies in currency are bound to happen. I'm bound to change inserting a character of something which is not clearly inserted, but CRDPs offer us a way to solve that problem. Okay? Um, CRDPs is not a product, it's not a a uh, library, it's not even a protocol. It's a, it's a mathematical framework uh, that you can use to think about, reason about, and build many different types uh, of data structures. Each one of them given, having different concurrency characteristics. Okay, so for instance, you can have a set uh, where if you do concurrent, if you add something, another group the same thing, and concurrently, you can have a set privileges the additions, or you can have a set that privileges the move concurrently, depending on the, on the implementation of CRDP. The important thing is that it obeys three rules. It's, uh, I'll explain later, it's um, immutable, meaning that messages can be delivered out of, out of uh, order, associative, which means that you can associate two messages and, and deliver that in a, bu in a body, or two or more messages, so you can always uh, uh, one state, 
and I did both of them. Their messages can be delivered more than one time, and they will still be good. Um, so, certainty enable what I said earlier coordination, mass collaboration in real time, and in an offline first time with all the certainty. Okay. So, let's explore a bit more this certainty line, which I think is very, very interesting. So let's say that we have one replica of a certain data type, and then we have a second replica of a certain uh, data type. Then we have a third replica of a certain data type, and uh, we have each one of them has their own individual state. So they have their own individual representation of that state, which may or may not be synced with other state. So the model here is that we have an asynchronous network communication between them. So this in some surprise lands where they exchange messages. That's that's the, 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 the system's model. Uh, the network requirements are that we can handle failures, right? So we can handle losing messages. Uh, it can handle messages being, being uh, swapped out of order, going out of order, uh, and it will shoot all still always. Um, this is a specific type of CRT using convergence CRT uh, with the characteristics that are already told in the real position to handle content, uh, where the state is broadcasted on every message. Okay, so since the state is broadcasted on every message, uh, you can still lose messages, but eventually other peers will catch on my state uh, later when I rebroadcast. Okay, make sense? Any any questions so far? That's a good question because this is a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, it's a kind of a one on one on CRTs. That's a, a very, very good question. Um, so, a quick example a grow only counter uh, is something where each replicate contributes to a grow to share counter, right? Very simple, kind of like a kid counter on, on a web client. And each replicate is like a server on, on a web client. Um, okay, so just a bit of maths. CRT is defined by uh, a state. Has an initial state, a joint, a joint function that merges two states, okay? A valid function that gets a state and continues to value, and some mutator that changes the state, okay? And the, for instance, in in the counter, there's an increment mutator that returns a new state, okay? Very simple, uh, very simple framework, okay? So let's try and build using this build uh, um, counter, a grow only counter, something that only can go up in a set of days. Okay, so the initial state would be zero, right? So join of two states would be the maximum of each one of the states. So if I receive a state from another peer uh, with, with a counter, I'm going to select the maximum of, of, of my state and the state from the other peer. Uh, the value would be the state itself, okay? And the data will be returning the state plus one. Okay, so increment would be my uh, value of three. I increment two steps four. Very simple. Let's see how this works on a network with three peers, like three to three to one. So uh, this is two. They oh sorry, uh, back. Okay, so they let's assume they start with a count of three. This one starts with a count of two, and this one starts with a count of one. And let's see how they sync up. Okay. Uh, what should be the final state when it all converges? One? Six. No, uh, four. Six. Six. Oh, exactly. six. So this one counted four. three hits, this one counted two hits, this one counted one. So oh, now they, they haven't communicated yet. But yeah. I'm assuming that that's the case. Okay? So they want to communicate. So it should be the sum of, of, of all these counters, right? So three plus two plus two plus one, six. Okay? So let's see how, how it works. So I'm, I'm sending two, max three of two is three. And max to three can be sent to this max to three, and they all converge to three, which is what we expect. But that was the first case. Okay, so let's let's try and complicate this a bit more. All right. So now the state is a map of node identifiers. So each node has a, an identifier, one, two, three, and maps those identifiers to a number counter. Okay, and it starts with an empty map. Okay, so uh, the join function, instead of just being the maximum 
of, of each one of the states is going to be the maximum for each one of the nodes in that map. So if I go node one, if I node two, my counter is two, my counter count is three, uh, uh, and I receive an update for me, I'm going to just for the same correct, I'm going to select maximum. So you can send me, oh no, that be one as a count of two. When you send me, oh no, that be one as a count of three, I'm going to select two for two. So this is a row only count for that node, for that particular node. Right. right? Make sense? Uh, so the value will be the sum of all the values in, in the state. So for all, all the nodes. And the Mojito is incrementing is to increment the value for the local node. For this local node I want to Okay? I'm not going to change the state for all the other nodes, just my local node. Okay? So I think this, this may work. So we start with a counter of three on this, a counter of two on that position, a counter of one. Mind you that each one of them has their own state individualized, right? So it's going to start uh, replicating. So I'm going to send this one, the maximum of this one is zero to one now. I'm going to replicate zero to one to here, maximum to three to one, right? And now this three to one, the maximum of three to one will be three to one also, right? So here, if I want to sync here, for instance, again, three to one, okay, here, the maximum with itself would be also three to one. So network is converged and the value would be the sum of all the, the values three to three to one, is six, okay? So this is a more, more refined example of what happens concurrently when you do increment, but the start state, sorry, this is the start state. What happens when there is a converge? So I think it got pretty clear. Mm -hmm. cool. So uh, this is a very simple CRDT. So this, this, the state of the CRDT is very, very, very simple, but you can build a lot of different CRDTs, like sets, races, arrays, and all, all the, the combinations that you want to do for different reasons. So for instance, there is, and I know that there's five implementations of, of different small arrays with different uh, uh, subroutines for existence and different accomplishments. Uh, so that's why there's a lot of finding, a lot of research and like every week there is a new CRDT. Um, so I'm going to, just going to give you some a link to some resources. When I'm past there's a research CRDT uh, repo that has a bunch of, of articles and um, talks, lectures, um, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and libraries. So how is this related to to Node.js? So to to JavaScript, I'm going to just go to code. For instance, Node.js is a library. So this is a, a, a PGP framework of functions that implements some types of CRDTs that you can use today to, to create uh, PGP applications. And there are other, this is the most common of those. Uh, also, there is, uh, there is also here, CRT, yeah. So there's the pure CRDT, which is JavaScript implementation of, of uh, CRDTs. Uh, and as you can see in the API, yeah. uh, there's a bunch of, of different. So we can on encounter, we can encounter, we can set, we can set a lot of sets, a lot of arrays implementation, uh, trade off for RDA, a lot of registers, and it's a good place to start uh, if you're interested in creating CRDTs on JavaScript. Um, by JS and uh, so this is all on this page of, of, of this resource page. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, so maybe like reference documentation would be wild. Yeah, there is a uh, there's a bunch. Uh, there is purepath.net, which is like a path for for computer not computer box, but like creating type of type of thing. They can do a markdown and, and collaborate with, with people uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. 
Charities, uh, all these kinds of definitions, but also a bit about so uh, about the zero is a charity. Always merges to zero. So you can you can be you can adapt some charities are more uh fit to certain use cases. Uh, it's just a mathematical framework to conceptualize these kinds of definitions of charity. Uh, you can yes, you can on the other question whether you can uh, see all the operations, right? Yeah. Version, yeah. Yes, you, an operation based charity is a huge state based charity where you, you don't have to do that. But you can also have uh, CDIDs. Well, never mind. Operation based charities, which instead of exchanging the state, they exchange the operations. And answering your question about whether the state can get very big, also the, the, the multiple operations can get big. But if the state gets big, you can have delta state charities to solve that, where uh, instead of propagating just the, the, the state or the operation, you propagate the delta. And the delta is different from the operation. The delta is something that's added to operation. So you could apply it to the state several times, you get the same thing. So it's, it's uh, there's, if you go to the research charity, you go behind the press, you can get out more of those definitions. It's still very research charity. I have a question. The use of I know I know about that I'm not, I'm not sure what the use of it is but I think the use of questions is not enough because there is uh, it never comes up when when you when there the use cases or when there is charities in the wild uh, that that you can get from the uh, for any charity that you could use a lot of information in backend so ready all the models and assemble how cloud has these charities for a lot of different things because they have like this this architecture with a lot of sharding and things like that. So we use charities a lot. On few 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 charities, there's still not a lot of use charities. So if you're tired of this use charity, it's not that much. Peter actually has a question. Yeah, Peter. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, I didn't hear you clearly, so I wanted to know how does it handle uh, conflict resolution? How to handle conflict resolution? Yes, using okay. CRB. Yeah, so. Uh, Can you stay close a bit, please? Uh, sure, sure, sorry. Uh, microphone, of course. Um, so the question was uh, how do we handle conflict free resolution? Um, the idea is that you don't uh, depends on on the on the charity itself. Uh, it doesn't. There's no specific way to to resolve uh, conflicts when they when they arise. Uh, the data structure that you use on a state itself must be conflict free, which means that uh, if there is there should be a way to treat concurrent values. Okay, um, whatever that means. 
prescribed. Uh, so, for instance, if you're inserting in the same position, what, what matters is that the final state is the same. So, for instance, if on RGA, which is one implementation of arrays, if your two people are inserting on the same position, one of them, or if I'm inserting on position two, you're inserting on position two, one of them will be inserting on position, position two, and then the other one inserting on position three. That means that one of them will actually, but it depends on the, on the CRDT itself. I'm talking about RGA, but there are many others uh, out there. So it's kind of up to you to decide the strategy how those things get resolved. Yes, and there is a mathematical framework to prove that it converges, right? Uh, so that's why it's a very academic oriented uh, thing. Uh, you, you have to, well, well, what I do is basically look at the papers that exist that solve my, my problem, and then try to implement them bug free on, on, on JavaScript. But I always bear in mind that different CRDTs have different trade-offs, okay? There's no magic bullet. Uh, there is no, you cannot, you cannot do bank accounts on, on, on CRDT. You cannot, right? you cannot do transactions on, on CRDT. It's a, a strong eventual consistent uh, framework, meaning that eventually everyone will get the same result. But other than that, Okay. Uh, I'm actually to guarantee the consistency eventually. Okay. There is no uh, I'm going to press for you ten dollars and okay. eventually I will press for you ten dollars. <laughs> One day. <laughs> I'm sorry, Peter. I'm not sure if I uh that's a good question. Yeah, I think I'm um, getting it, understanding it better. I think I still need to read more about it. But I was thinking and also about maybe how I could, uh, if it's something I could liberate for my solution too. Uh, if there's something like uh, client side DB that uh, implement this, that I could just maybe use to store one of uh, data sets and have it handle offline uh, conflict of it, you know, uh, just a, a portion of the data sets. Yeah, there is no magic book in the sense. If I define like uh, and I push a simple map to, to your service, everything else that changes the uh, one value of that map, and I change the same key, um, one of us will, will, will win. Okay? But if you want to resolve that, you have to tell two versions and someone else managing the conflict, you have to have some way of managing the conflict. Uh, it's explicit, explicit. You have to have codes, guess both versions, and somehow decides, I don't know, order, lexicographic value, or the, the changes timestamp, so, so last right wins, for instance, or some way like that. On the other, if you have a CRDT, uh, you don't have conflict, right? So you, it's not your code that solves conflict. It's CRDT has a framework that solves conflict. Oh, okay. With the trade-off of the state being more complex, the internal state being more complex than just a simple map or a simple map. That's pretty cool. Um, the framework or library or database that I could check out for this. Yeah, there's a resource here. Uh, I could, uh, well, on Meetup, I'll post the, the link to slides and then to the video uh, if you're interested for everyone. Uh, okay. Yeah, YJS. Yeah, YJS. And there's a peer list. There's a bunch of them. Uh, they're all listed. Uh, the resources for, 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 for people, uh, but I'll share on, on Meetup. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Then kind of bring this home.
Hello, Andre. Right? Yes. Starting with Andre, we're finishing with Andre. Uh huh, exactly. <laughs> So, I'm Andre, some people here already know me. I'm a full stack developer. I, I work as a consultant. I'm now working for two companies, Art Web and uh, Softkey. Uh, I'm going to talk here about Stencil, uh, which is a way to build web components. So, let's start by show of hands. Anybody here have heard of web components know what it is? Everyone kind of knows what it is. All right. So, my best explanation for web components is your own HTML package. So, with web components, it's, it's a new browser API. What they allow us to do is to get our own uh, tags and then be able to share them uh, in projects and, and, and the way they work is the same as any other native HTML tag that the browser comes with. So it's a JavaScript API. So you need JavaScript to create a web component. But other than that, uh, it's shareable amongst other browsers it's part of the standard, so it's natively supported on some browsers. There's, there's Polyfill is one of the ones that I want to talk about. And uh, they allow you, one of the benefits of this, of course, is they allow you to encapsulate your uh, UI components. The ones are, are very popular nowadays with things like uh, React and Vue. And, and so programming, user interfaces, components is something most people do nowadays. And what this does is you can start using components and the benefits of using components like encapsulation without needing a framework. They are part of the native JavaScript API. Or if you want, you can continue to use the benefits. So native web components work in React like a select tag pattern, so uh, and the same for Angular or any other uh, any other framework. It's it solves many of the shared component problems. Uh, so if you have nowadays, let's say you build a cool React component that you have something, you cannot take that component and uh, use it in a simple page, you cannot, without having React all, all there, you cannot take a component from React and use it in Angular. Components are not, uh, cannot be shared between them. And, uh, components here can not only work in frameworks, they can work without frameworks. As I said, there's, uh, it's part of the standard, so there's uh, an intention to implement it all browsers. Uh, there's some support right now natively for browsers. There's some good polyfills out there. Uh, I'll talk about that so later. So web components in reality refers to four different things. And all of them can be used independently. So you don't need to support all the four basic uh, parts of web components. You don't have to use them all. You can just use an element elements is the part that allow you to create your own tags, JavaScript API. They are supported uh, in all modern browsers nowadays. You have HTML template. So HTML template is a new tag which 
the template tag. It allows you to uh, have inert HTML. And inert HTML is not stupid. It's like mini DOM that's there. It's not, if the browser doesn't put it on the page, you can stand there inert until you instantiate it. You can instantiate it multiple times. So this is, there's good support for HTML templates in this browser. Then there's two more, um, not so well supported than this, but it's a controversial uh, component. Parts of our components is this. One of them is the Shadow DOM. So the idea of Shadow DOM, Shadow DOM is a JavaScript class. The idea of Shadow DOM is that each component has its own DOM hidden from the rest of the system. And you can style your components internally without the styles, for example, leaking to the main page. Shadow DOM, for me, it's an excellent addition. One of the problems with Shadow DOM is it's very hard to host. So all browsers have to support it in a way natively that they can start to use. Otherwise, it's very slow. But the idea that you can uh, keep your styling internally to your components can have oops, parts of the styling can come from the page host component, but you have other parts that can't. So this would make like styling and uh, templating much, much easier. The final part is one that I believe is going to be not which is HTML imports. The idea of HTML imports was that you could import a web component your page in the page but it wouldn't need JavaScript. You just do a link tag to a URL where the component was hosted and it would become available on the page. Uh, this was implemented natively uh, by Chrome, but the other uh, vendors, uh, there was Chocolate and uh, Firefox and, and Apple uh, decided not to implement it. You go to the ES6 module, so always go through the JavaScript side of things, not the JavaScript side of things, and use the ES6 uh, modules as a base for this. So I'm not sure what I read somewhere that uh, I think uh, even Chrome is going to phase out HTML import, so we're going to stay with those two three parts. Custom, a custom element is just a tag. So you're implementing what the tag does inside, but it uses the same way to write tag templates in the application. It has attributes, which is the tag. It has inner uh, content as well, which is the new tag, the R. It has a small detail, which is have something dash something. So like here in my dash component. The idea is that uh, to avoid uh, conflicts with the normal internal browser tags. So one possible way here is that of course before the tag, before the dash you put something in. Uh, this is the way we register, register a custom element. So this is the standard the JavaScript way. So you define a class that has to extend HTML element, uh, and then you have a series of uh, lifecycle uh, hooks and callbacks that you can uh, that you can then use to uh, code your component. Document register element. Is the, is the JavaScript browser API in which you can register as an element. Uh, notice that the my dash component has to be a class that is associated with my dash component. Uh, what's the name of this uh, case? Way to write the. Oh, chemical okay. things. Chemical things. Right. So this has to be like that, otherwise, it doesn't work. 
So if it's an I dash component, it has to be capital M and not capital T. So it's like the translation between uh, the CSS property and the JavaScript. Exactly, exactly. This property. is not this is not new the way it went. Yeah. So if you JavaScript side of the CSS, the text align is not text dash. So I haven't talked about status. So but uh, uh, using web components nowadays, you have to think about a lot of stuff. Uh, polygons, for example, that works in parts. Uh, lots of things. And um, what guys at Stencil did is they built a compiler. Create the way to build a web component, and then you run File process for the web component, and they treat, uh, they deal with generating all the old fields, all the code that's necessary to work today. And, uh, but not not only that, they add some framework elements that we are used to now in our modern framework. They add that to the component. So, uh, and also a good thing they do is they polyfill is used in a way that it's only triggered when the browser is open. The exception not used to be. Compiler for web components. And uh, important to say that the output is The idea is that in the future you will need uh, polyfills and the output is just a web component. It has nothing that's proprietary. Um, and, uh, Stencil was created by the guys at Ionic. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They have a UI library. Um, they keep it Angular. Um, they're Migrating everything they built, all their components from uh, the Angular component model they use to the web component. And so, but they have a large, large client base. Many of the Cordova apps, so the app stores today, are built based on Angular. So, one of the characteristics of Stencil, and not of, of Stencil, but Web components in general that performance is much higher. I mean, you're, you're using native code, you're very little code, it's much faster, much in line with the expectations of mobile applications. Of course, if you the idea that we're building web components, so React is not going to be. But standards stay here for a much longer time. So when you're building with this, you're building with standards, so it's much more future than uh, betting on it. I remember Angular J has the first version of Angular with this. And it has left many people hanging. Uh, but that's the way things evolve, of course. In this case, it's that's why standards take a long time to decide it. And when decided, they stay a long time. Sometimes for the work. Sometimes for the work. Uh, interoperability is an important aspect. So, again, you don't have to love React. I know you do, but you don't have to stop using React. And you have the benefit of the component you build can be React handles. And what the guys that Ionic did with Stencil is they kept the same way of building components, using the components from React and Angular 
and same architecture of patterns that React uses, I think, are more important than the library itself. The way we transmit props down and events up to the screen, that's, that's the way Sansa works. I forgot to say that Stencil uses TypeScript. So it's one of these good ways to familiarize yourself with what TypeScript is. It's awesome. <laughs> I would say, I'll, I'll say something controversial. I'll say that uh, TypeScript is as important for JavaScript code quality as JavaScript code quality is for the text of the language. But that's not something. <laughs> Over beer. If you do your time. <laughs> and if you do your text. <laughs> so, um, to build a, a web component in Stencil, you have a series of decorators. Uh, decorators inform the Stencil, uh, and, and in essence, will generate JavaScript code in this new functionality. So, here you see that um, the Components are decorated here. I'm simply stating that uh, the tag I want for my, my component, and in the case of stencil, what kind of, if I have an external style sheet, I can also, or CSS or SAS or whatever, I can um, put it here and do stencil when compiled. It'll recognize that that's SAS and that's the other thing, and then it'll, it'll compile it when it's compiled. Yeah, the, um, the compiler it can compile SAS and not SAS anymore. I mean, I guess it's But it's in the compiler, so okay. if you write SAS, you don't have to have an external SAS. Okay. Um, so, this sounds familiar to anyone who programs React. So, this uses so it's built into the compiler. Um, it's not going it generates JavaScript code not into the text, of course, but it can if someone uses to build it into the component, it can do this. And you can also notice here that uh, another uh, decorator, which the way we define which attribute. Props in the React web sim are passed in from the outside to our component. So that what this means is that this component will have an attribute name which so stencil is much more than web component, as you can see, it has a uh, virtual DOM, so it uses the same uh, DOM comparison technique for rendering that React uses. Uh, there are other ways to do that now, nowadays, and I'll do a little bit of a glitch to show you how to do this complexly. Basic complexities. Um, I think that's uh, something that the guys at Sensor said they were looking at. But anyway, for now, they use a fast uh, virtual. Lazy loading, so that's actually very cool. So if you, uh, you don't have, you only, the component is only loaded when you instantiate an object. So in practice, this means, let's say you have, uh, you have an Ajax call that uh, then renders a web component in the package. And you have to put a stencil uh, Thing at the beginning, but it wouldn't it wouldn't load immediately. Only when the web component uh, instantiated on the DOM, then uh, the stencil uh, code will be run. And of course, reactivity with the virtual DOM uh, is also baked in. So it uses also a sync rendering system. Um, the 
I don't know if you were familiar with uh, React Fiber, so it's uh, the same uh, same techniques as React Fiber, GSX, of course. And you can also render services. I mean, it's just a reference. You guys probably for this, uh, but uh, the API, you have props, you have state, react. Uh, you can trigger events on a component. Those events can be uh, custom events that could be uh, listened outside the web components. So I'm going to run the page. You can listen for events right from your uh, children. And you can grab it on element. Quick example of to use state. So there's a um, there's a, a decorator called uh, at state. Like there was one at props. So this one, what in essence, what I'm saying here is that the completely triggers the array of and you'll notice here that uh, one thing I like is that a stencil doesn't need the set state. Just call this and your state uh, state variable, and uh, React knows that after you change that, you need to do that. Like if this was uh, React, you would be doing a set state. No, it's compiled. So it's just uh, the wraps. But it, it's with different like uh, and props are also accessible via this drop but props are not changeable, so you get a runtime error, constant error. Uh, <clears throat> and then of course you have the you have the GSX. Mentioned this, um, Stencil will eventually run natively on browsers. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's the idea, so it wouldn't be in. Nowadays, with things, with the, if you compile Stencil components, you'll get JavaScript. If you put JavaScript on, on your page, you can easily display it. So you can do that in any. Ideally, in the future, you wouldn't need that much JavaScript. Or you wouldn't need to display the car and all of that. In comparison to the vanilla web component, uh, what Stencil does is um, it brings out all the here's the DOM, uh, yes, X, uh, the API to make it easier and more familiar for those. Again, it's all being So, any questions? Uh, so, state management, something like the or things to the website? No, you can plug it in Redux, even the same Redux you use. Yeah. Uh, so, any state management solution can be used. The idea of state management is that you have a centralized part of the code that transmits state as prop down the tree. So props here is just a So basically, they just you know pre rendered on the web, so it's basically service that you put in the URL, and they get the browser, they give you a package. Uh, 
then there must have gone to the Greek world who maybe not alive, but who still kept the whole part of the Roman Catholic faith. So it's good to survive. It's good to survive. It's good to survive. It's good to survive. So I'm just curious. So, I'm not sure if this helps. This is a, uh, like a simple example using uh, an ex uh, Node.js Express Builder. Yeah, they have a render, and you'll get the you get the string, you don't need to do this. Yeah. Then you pass the string to your template. I haven't looked at it as server size, but I, 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 I don't expect to have any issues. More questions? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. But you have to think about it, like, what what can be a web page? Let's say you have, like, a, a series of applications and uh, they all share the same certain backend stuff. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure what you mean to separate the devices, but the, the idea of the component is, for me, at least the way I see it, the component itself must be uh, independent and work by itself. So if you abstract something out of the component, Kind of non UI thing, I think that's what you were touching there. The component is no longer, I mean, the component, you always need that part if you abstract it away. I mean, it doesn't make sense. The component has ideally it's, it runs by itself. And sometimes you can do stuff like um, just a simple component that you can actually get that someone could kind of manage to it. Sure. Yeah, it should keep, yeah, so that, that's the argument that you should keep the components as simple and as self contained as possible. So if, if you look at, like, uh, let's say a typical component, a video player, a video app, so it's just that. <laughs> Check the CD is there, then I have a little bit more to right. direction. No, that, that was not a good video. <laughs> well, let's say it's select component. So it selects that. So it keeps the, the item selected, fires an event, which has an effect on the uh, chain. They force, it. they force it to change outside near the API. Uh, you can also do that with stencil. Your ostensible component can have public methods. It can invoke the JavaScript. Or it can trigger an event and you can do it from outside. Everything you can do with a normal DOM HTML, you can do with this. That's the way it's Just create the app path, which is yeah, yeah. Not, not like a design of dependencies. How's the story for the Okay, so there's a create stencil app. <laughs> so they have two. They have two. I don't know if they have two. Okay, so they have a create stencil app if you want to create a 
Sensor lab, it's much the compile process will generate a, a full page like the HTML tag and what is the difference between otherwise and this one? No, we have a you know root entirety, <laughs> much, much smaller. But in this case, it's not much smaller because they have to have some different conditions to react. All of them, but the logical part is always the same. I don't know. Another part of the components itself, they're rewriting everything and then so they're moving out. Components is the idea is that in the very uh, near future, you will be able to take a ionic component by itself, no other dependencies whatsoever. Let's say you want to use like their. Calendar component, I'm not really sure what that is. So you can go there, take the calendar component, put it on the page, use the calendar without any other dependencies, without Angular, without any state management, just use what the page says. I think that's good. I think that's having that uh, possibility of much better than being stuck with uh, React where. Components use the React React. And look, you can still use React, so if you go well, don't worry, I, I don't love React. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's not the issue. I mean you can use this as a normal tag, HTML tag, and pass the state or the props uh, to the attributes of So uh, just that it only loads all tools in the default. So it's uh, yeah, okay, okay. So, but I forgot to add that it doesn't use Shadow DOM. Uh, the only um, the only policy for it, the only part of the web component is using Shadow DOM. So it's like a founding of syntax. So I don't know. It's, it's, they use, and they had a good reason for that because they're, they have an extensive uh, tile sheet for their existing components. And they use something like uh, naming, namespacing class. And moving that to Shadow DOM, first of all, Shadow DOM is not possible because it's flawed. And the polyfill is crazy. So that, that was not an option. Even if it was an option, converting those uh, massive classes they have namespace classes to shadow DOM uh, takes too much memory. So they're not they keeping the way they do styling the same. Uh, so that's why uh, I don't think styling doesn't much memory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the issues. Yeah. But I, but that I think that ends with uh, with Sentinel because each component, what they I think they're doing is that they have a core which they have to compile, which is shared by all components. And then each component has its own sort of thing. I mean, if you use like the calendar app example, I'm not talking about their entire ionic file.
<laughs> no, I'm not sure if the solution that exists nowadays uh, with style, C G style CSS going to JS or something like that. I have a solution, I'm not sure if they are. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think Shadow DOM was is a good step in that direction. But again, very hard to follow, as you can imagine. Uh, because in practice, like a new DOM tree, completely isolated uh, from the page. And But it's not, you're speaking about components as an architecture way of doing yeah, things, yeah. not the, 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 not the standards. Standards, I'm saying web components, back end was supported web components, back end because they all work around the web things that you can do I think only after the end of the one year two, when we moved from the now to the end of one component, to the web end, the thing, people start looking for the same thing. It's only the right, now is the final job. I'm just saying, I think React, uh, people started doing their own thing. I think React and with the facilities of React is available. State management with React Redux and things like that. Um, people start understanding why web components was a, a, a good way uh, to build complex UI. Now we have this on the browser as native, as a, as a standard. So, uh, and, and I said to Pedro uh, ago, uh, you can use Redux. You can use Redux without React. And I think this is good for uh, UI development. Uh, there's some merit in React. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. It was fun for me. I, you know, coming here for a month on the back seat and get to meet a bunch of people working from their fields. You know, like I said, if anybody wants to go get a beer afterwards, uh, actually, I cannot. You know, you can. Uh, uh oh, I've had punch, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. If anybody wants to go, we can do that. Um, Thank you for hosting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for your, for your help. Yeah, yeah, kind of getting it set up and everything. And thanks, Peter, for, for joining us. I'm going to sign off now. Bye, Peter. <laughs>